UFC makes its debut in Ottawa this Saturday for UFC Fight Night 89, the 20th event in Canada, headlined by an amazing welterweight fight between Rory McDonald and Stephen Thompson. I'm Mike Bond. This is Jordan Breen of SureDog.com, and we are sitting in the bleachers of TD Place Stadium, where the Ottawa Red Blacks of the CFL play. And Jordan, another great event in Canada, another event headlined by a Roy McDonald fight, and it, quite possibly it could be his last in the UFC. We can get to that later, but just this matchup with Stephen Thompson, I think a lot of people love this fight. Very intriguing clash of styles. Uh, how do you really break it down? It seems like not a lot of people know how to assess this fight and what these guys need to do to win. You are the all-knowledgeable MMA expert that I trust you know, more than anyone out there. So give us your assessment. What do each of these guys need to do to get the win here? Well, I mean, both guys definitely need to just like fight within themselves. You know what I mean? Roy McDonald needs to harken back to the same style that got him to a uh, welterweight title shot against Robbie Lawler last year and helped author the 2015 fight of the year. He needs to be able to go out there, jab, work distance, try to counter punch Stephen Thompson. If he's able to hurt him, move him back to the cage, open up the combinations. And if he sees the opportunity to use his wrestling, use it exploited as fully as possible the problem is because his fight with Robbie Lawler last July was so destructive so deleterious to both men's health both guys took such damage and of course Roy McDonald getting his nose smashed and fell in the fifth round even though he's only 26 years old people still have no idea about how he's going to look coming back that is the question for most people when you look at Roy McDonald being a, a slight underdog in some sports books it's not because people think Roy McDonald's less well-rounded than Stephen Thompson it's not that Stephen Thompson is that devastating of a knockout striker even though he clearly has an incredible offensive arsenal it's that people aren't just sure what to expect out of Roy McDonald against someone that has such high octane offense I still favor Roy McDonald I don't think that this is a case of a 26 year old fight or being damaged goods, but frankly, I don't think it's going to shock anyone if 11 months off maybe isn't enough to get over the toll of the Robbie Lawler fight in conjunction with the fact that as we saw in his fight with Johnny Hendricks, Stephen Thompson, he's not some karate flash in the pan. It's not just a stylistic bugaboo for some guys. It wasn't just like he landed a, a surprise kick on Johnny Hendricks. He landed absolutely everything in their fight. He was just tethered to his face and as soon as he opened up with kicks behind the punches, it was over. So if Thompson's in the zone immediately, maybe we get a, a very quick sense that either Thompson Thompson is just on that level now, or Rory McDonald has some bumps and bruises that simply can't be healed in 11 months. But I still think with how good his boxing is, I think he is like a superior technical boxer to Stephen Thompson, how good the jab is, the way he works off the counter, and then hurting people with combinations after already stunning them, plus the wrestling advantage. I still favor Rory McDonald, but knowing knowing that what we don't know about Roy McDonald, knowing that we're sitting here waiting for uh, 11 months of questions to be answered about what he looks like physically after the Robbie Lawler war, I mean, if Stephen Thompson goes out and puts it on him in three minutes, it's it, it's it, it wouldn't be that hard to believe after what we saw last July for Roy McDonald and the toll he took against Robbie Lawler, as well as what we've seen recently from Stephen Thompson, a guy who's just found a way to integrate his high-octane offense into a, a wholesale, well-rounded MMA game. Yeah, and both guys admitted at Thursday's open workouts that strategizing for this fight has been the most difficult of their career on each side. So. It's very compelling. I mean, I think you make a lot of good, great points about the Roy McDonald uh, coming back from the Robbie Lawler thing, but he seems more focused than ever, and it, it's because also he has all these other things going on. He has a baby on the way, uh, final fight on his UFC contract. Do any of these variables play into a fight? Like, is that something that you can calculate, or do you just have to really look at these two guys' style, and do you not think they bring any of the outside factors? Because also, Stephen Thompson... Even coming off that Johnny Hendricks win, I feel like this is maybe a more difficult matchup for him because Rory's just a very, very well-rounded fighter. With Rory, I mean, I mean, how he clearly he's a different kind of person. It's not even just about the the damage he took 11 months ago against against Robbie Lawler. He's just a different kind of guy. He sees the world differently. I mean, going back to the Lawler fight when he lost, people basically said like, "Wow, that was horrific. Like, aren't you glad that's over?" Isn't it terrible you lost? And he went, you know, he flatly basically said at the post press conference, this is, this is the greatest night of my life. I've never had a better fight than this. It's like, dude, you lost in the biggest fight of your life. You got your nose broken. This is horrific. And this guy sees it as a badge of honor. Like, I've never been a better man than I was tonight, the night that Robbie Lawler smashed my face in half. And he had similar kind of feelings when Carlos Condit was able to come back and stop him a few years ago. Roy McDonald just doesn't process things the way that the average person does. We may make fun of him and be like, oh, you're weird, you have an anti-charisma, oh, you're actually a serial killer, ha ha ha. But the fact is, like, he's kind of a dude that's made for fighting. So I can see that cutting both ways. If he's kind of got the personality where, you know, the, the, the personal stuff 
is a drain on him or or sort of creeps into the focus he's had before. I don't think that's surprising. But I, I do think, um, gun to my head, I would imagine that Roy McDonald's the kind of guy that not just soldiers through this, but is able to compartmentalize it. You know what I mean? This guy loves fighting. This is what he's done essentially since he was 13 or 14 years old. This is what he's trained for. And again, we have this narrative now of talking about, well, he's going to be a free agent. He was beat up last year. We talk about him like he's a 36-year-old, and he's 26, yeah. you know? Yeah, and it's interesting. You mentioned the free agency thing there. This isn't a Benson Henderson. This isn't a Matt Mitrione. This is a 26-year-old contender who's, you know, the number two ranked guy in the world. So much upside, more championship fights in his future very well. So I'll just ask you point blank, yes or no question. Is this the last time we see Rory McDonald fighting in the UFC? I don't think so, especially if he wins. Obviously, win and lose has, has a kind of... Uh, a big potential rich payoff here. If he wins, he's able to obviously command more money from the UFC. And frankly, welterweight being as good as it is, if he loses, it's not like he's an also ran. It's not like he could never fight for a title again. But with Tyron Woodley already lined up, this is essentially, as you mentioned off the top, part of the reason that people are so into this fight, it's not just that it's a good style matchup or you know both guys are highly ranked. This is basically a de facto welterweight title eliminator. The expectation is that the winner of this fight, even if it's Rory McDonald and he has to wait for a new contract, the expectation is the winner of this fight is going to wait for the winner of Lawler Woodley and, and fight for the title. So, I mean, that is that is some some pretty potent stuff that if he was able to win, he's clearly going to get a big deal and be able to reap the benefits there. But where the UFC are going to keep coming to Canada, and frankly, with all due respect to Elias Theodorou and Chad Laprise and Olivia Aubin Mercier, there's no GSPs around. Rory McDonald is a definitive step down, but someone who can still sell still get a bit of a TV audience and certainly get the hardcore MMA fans excited. If we're in McDonald's gone, what do you even do for a card in Canada, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And it makes even more sense the fact that UFC is going back to Vancouver, August 27th, UFC on Fox 21. His Rory province. McDonald, yeah, his province. He just seems like a shoe in to headline that card or co main event, whatever it may be. But just moving on from the main event, uh, obviously that's the main fight of the night, but co headliner Patrick Cote versus Donald Cerrone. Donald Cerrone makes it to Canada, gets through the border. Uh, Fighting post, out post his passport and social insurance or social security number on Twitter. You what did. a hero. He did. And fighting out welterweight, Donald Cerrone, he had his last fight versus Alex Oliveira, but that was a kind of a different circumstance. Oliveira is pretty much a lightweight as well. Patrick Cote has fought at 205, fought Tito Ortiz, fought for the title at 185. Uh, is, you know, breaking down this fight, how much of a factor is size going to play in it? I think it's interesting too because Cote is clearly the more robust guy. Like he's physically larger, but it's it's one of those questionable things about how do you construe larger because Cerrone is really skinny but he's got wide shoulders and he's much taller than Cote is so I mean if they sit on a bench press rack or start doing squats or something like that like I'm sure Cote can beat Cerrone in like lots of gym measurables but we're talking about two guys that are probably going to want to fire strikes at each other if they're fighting from distance Cote is going to have to be that one step inside of Cerrone's jab that one step inside of all Cerrone's kicks and box him up he's got to do what, you know, Rafael Dos Anjos did in the first fight. I mean, maybe if he's lucky, do what Rafael Dos Anjos did in the second fight. He's got to be, like, inside of Cerrone and fight that way consistently. And it, it's within his wheelhouse, but as good as Cote's comeback has been, I think if you look at the opposition he's faced, I mean, Ben Saunders, Donald Cerrone would be a fun-as-hell fight, but I would still favor Donald Cerrone. I think he's a, a better striker. He's not going to get caught in the clinch and drilled with a million knees by Ben Saunders. He's not going to get slowed down by rubber guard. So as... As exciting as Cote's resurgence has been, and as lovely as it would be to keep going, I think he's competitive. I, I do think this might go all 15 minutes, but I still think the better chance to finish this fight, it resides with Cerrone in multiple ways. I honestly think Cote has one of the best chins in MMA history. I mean, the only dude to really knock him out was Alan Belcher with a, a pro wrestling style pile driver, not even like a punch or a kick. Uh, it takes some effort and some doing, but Cerrone also has a monster chin. The only guys who've really hurt him in MMA, they've hurt him to the body. That's how Dos Anjos hurt him. That's how uh, Anthony Pettis hurt him. Cote is not a big body attack guy. He's a guy that prefers to either box from distance or move into the clinch and dirty box against the fence. And I just don't think that's particularly effective against Cerrone for 15 minutes, never mind if Cerrone hurts him or if Cerrone is able to wrestle him down, knock him down, put him on the ground where... Cote, he's a much better defensive grappler and, and general grappler than he's been ever. Kudos to him, continuing with his work with uh, Fabio Holanda. But I, I still don't think he's good enough to survive Cerrone if they essentially have 
for for the better part of 15 minutes have some kind of grappling match or clinch fest up against the fence. So when I see Cerrone out there, minus 160, minus 180, that looks like good betting value to me, but I can't completely dismiss Patrick Cote because he at least is tough as hell. He's not someone that's going to get hit with a head kick and just fall over dead the way that many of Cerrone's uh, opponents do. And on top of that, he does have a jab. He can counter punch. If he can find that good distance just inside of Cerrone's lead hand and inside of his kicks, I don't think it's too crazy to imagine he could possibly win two rounds. Still, I like Cerrone to get it done. I do think it's an advantageous style matchup for him, even if Pat Cote has looked otherworldly good in a way that we never could have imagined maybe two years ago. Yeah, I, and I like Donald Cerrone there as well. I think this is probably the last time we see him at welterweight. It seems, talking to him this week, I think he's going to go back to lightweight. I think a lot of it could have to do with the upcoming title fight between Dos Anjos and Eddie Alvarez next month. But either way, I think Cerrone, he's just doing this temporarily, the 170 stint. And, but I like him in this fight as well. I think it's a very interesting matchup. And uh, those are the top two fights on the card. There's some other good ones out there. Uh, Joanne Calderwood and Valerie Letourneau, the first UFC women's straw or flyweight fight, actually. Both of them going up. I love that the UFC is allowing them op that opportunity. Any other one fighter, one fight that really interests you on this card besides you know the three I mentioned there? I would say actually like across the board on the undercard, this is like, this is a card that has a lot of boomer bust potential, I think. I think when you look across the undercard and look at not just how the Canadian fighters match, but how fighters match across the board, there's live underdogs, there's a lot of fights that are competitive but have the, the chance for like finishes either way. So I think this is one of those kind of sleeper cards where you got some magnetism at the top. You have some names that people recognize. If Cerrone and Cote were able to bring it and McDonald Thompson ended in some kind of stoppage, I think it's fair to kind of imagine that the undercard may bring it in a way that, that people maybe aren't anticipating. And, uh, I mean, that could be huge. But so, so long as we're talking about Canadians, I mean, 205 is still so desperate for anyone resembling a prospect that if Misha Serkinov can kind of capitalize on some of the hype that he's had for the last six or seven years even before he started mixed martial arts when he was just a, 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 a jiu-jitsu grappler and people saw his physical size and ability and thought wow maybe someday yeah. if he can get through uh, Yanni uh, Kutalaba and, and rip him up on the ground I mean we, we can make jokes all we want but Nikita Krylov is at worst a top 15 light heavyweight in the entire world yeah. you know if he won two or three more fights he's gonna fight for a UFC title we're talking about the fighting Al Capone, you know? So anytime you can get a 205 pound prospect going, especially if they could be from, you know, the, the northern side of the border, the better. Because like I said, with all due respect to, you know, Elias Theodore, whose fight with Sam Alvey will probably be wild as hell. They'll probably just kick at each other for 15 minutes like gangbusters. You know, with all due respect to the Chad Laprises and Olivier Aubin Merciers, the, the best Canadian fighters are still probably going to be ones in less deep weight classes. And frankly, 205 is still so starving for, for those kind of prospects. And Misha Serkinov is such an incredible athlete that if he could even emerge as like a top 15, top 10 guy, I think it would be a, a big boon for the UFC cards in Canada, but also be a big shot of adrenaline in the arm for the 205 pound division where once you get beyond those top five or six guys, it's just so hard to create interesting new matchups. Yeah, and Misha Serkinov made some interesting comments earlier this week saying that breaking his opponent's jaw in his last fight actually got him more recognition and respect from his fellow UFC fighters. So very interested to see him back in the octagon, but it's a great card top to bottom sold out in 15 minutes according to Tom Wright so just should be a packed house here in Ottawa on Saturday night and very much looking forward to it you can catch all the coverage on MMAJunkie.com all fight night and thank you very much for watching our preview show <laughs>